lose weight, be more productive, be more beautiful to yourself and others, overcome most physical and mental illnesses, and all without getting out of bed, I dare say you might not believe me, but the good news is that it's true. A wealth of evidence has shown that sleep can improve all of these behaviours and many more besides. But while our bodies are apparently resting, recuperating, dead to the world, our brains are anything but that. A whole wealth of evidence from medics, geneticists, neuroscientists and psychologists have shown us that when we are apparently asleep in a safe space, our minds are actively processing information, integrating this into whole new, reorganised ways, allowing us to remember those salient experiences later on. It's not unconscious, it's not dead to the world. But how do we know any of this? A whole wealth of evidence shows us that when we go to sleep, brain centres that uh, activate emotion are really very active indeed. We can also ask people what kind of mental content accompanies those sleeping experiences. And without fail, those experiences are emotional. There's something special then about emotional salient experiences that highlight that they need to be reactivated at a time when, funnily enough, we're somewhat unsafe or vulnerable when we're asleep. Neuroscientists can back this up. When we go to sleep, the limbic system, the emotion centres, and in particular the amygdala, the fear centres, are really very active in a stage of sleep we call REM, REM, rapid eye movement sleep. When we first go to sleep though, as you'll see from this hypnogram here, we enter very quickly into the deepest stages of sleep, the really restorative ones, the ones that make us feel less tired when we've had some of that. That's led some people to say that because that sleep is prioritised, anything that comes after that is bonus, or not so necessary. But what we do see is that after we've had that, in increasingly lengthy bouts, we experience this REM sleep, and that's the time when these emotion centers are really very active. So it's anything but bonus. It's absolutely crucial to help us with our survival and our fear. What's more interesting is that if we wake people up from those stages, they tend to report quite emotional experiences and mental content themselves. Something like, it might be quite mundane, something that's familiar from their waking life, but it's reorganised into a different pattern that makes it seem a little bit bizarre. For example, you might see something like, well, you were driving to work and it was normal, but you were in your hometown that you haven't lived in for 10 years and you didn't drive when you were there. What's more, you're driving from the back seat and your neighbour's dog is talking to you, telling you to escape. Not quite so normal in waking life, we hope, um, but perfectly normal in our dreams. So another way of understanding this emotion processing is by asking people to report their dreams. When we do that, we see interesting patterns, and there's lots of different ways that we can do it. We can try and be as systematic as possible to access those dreams as close to the experience as we can to get a really scientific and valid measure of what's happening when we're asleep. No other method can do that. Neuroimaging is great, but it can't give us that rich information. Freud called dreams a window onto the unconscious. Well, dreams are very much conscious, actually. We just need to find a way of accessing them really, really well. If I were to ask you about your dreams that you could remember, you might recall something really very emotional, maybe even a nightmare. And that's typical, because we have a memory bias towards the really emotional things, because we need to remember that information. That's important to us. But if we systematically sample and wake people up throughout the night, we get dreams not just from REM, but all through different stages of sleep. But they're still a little bit more emotional than our waking lives, and they're still really quite interesting. So when we explore these different patterns, what do we see? What we see are some commonalities across individual different dreams. What we see is that when we're dreaming of our waking lives, we don't dream of them in exactly the same way as they actually happened. Instead, we fragment them. We break them down into elements of different kinds of memories, and then we piece them back together again to create a whole new experience. And we think that fragmentation and that reorganisation is really important. It's functional. What it does is it breaks those experiences down into bite-sized, manageable chunks. We can play out those different features in different contexts, 
see which are salient, which are emotional, which are important for remembering in the future, and then we can get rid of the other stuff. So we tend to dream of our waking lives in this distantly associated way. But that's not always the case. There are times when we dream of things a bit more literally. Take the example of having a near miss. You have almost been run over by a red car. When we're asleep in our dreams, you might dream of red, but not in terms of the red car. And that gives you an opportunity to see, is red the signal for danger? Well, possibly not in this case. What's the signal for danger is that you need to be in control of moving yourself out of the way of the car and also keeping an eye as to where that car is at the same time. You can take those bits, break them down, put them in different contexts, and then be left with the emotion that's an indication of the bits that we need to remember. Sometimes these are not near misses. Take the example of a life-threatening car accident. People who sometimes engage in these awful experiences suffer afterwards. They have flashbacks. We're talking about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. This emotional traumatic experience interrupts waking and sleeping thought in equal measure. In the day, we call them flashbacks. At night, they're nightmares. This is the only case when we dream of something in exactly the same way that it actually happened in waking life. Because so great is the emotion, it can't yet be decoupled from the experience itself. It's all important and it's all salient. What we do know is that over time, if we have the opportunity to sleep, we can begin to process it. We can begin to break those memories down in ways that are helpful to allow us to integrate it into our long-term memory structures. It's difficult because people who have nightmares are often afraid to go to sleep, but that's the best scenario. So actually, if we study dreams while that's happening, we can chart the therapeutic journey. It gives us some hope for understanding how we might be able to get over these traumatic experiences in the future. So that's pretty optimistic, I think. That's great. We know that we need to sleep. It helps us process our emotions. It helps us to regulate them. If we think about what happens when we haven't regulated our emotions, we haven't slept well. Think about if you have had a bit of a late night and you wake up, you stub your toe on the bed, you might give the bed a little kick for getting in your toes way. You might be stuck behind a car that's held you up on the way to work. If you slept well, you can manage each of these situations. You can cope with them. So this is all quite positive. We need to sleep well, but unfortunately, that's not the case for most people. Because we know we're not sleeping enough. We know we need to sleep more. It's unfortunate because the people who need to sleep more often end up cranky in the day, their emotions haven't been regulated. They end up stressed, fatigued, and that impacts on their ability to switch off at night. So they enter into this really poor, unfortunate sleep-wake cycle. What's worse is that if you're sleep-deprived, you're less accurate at identifying that you need sleep. Some people even brag about the fact that they can get away with such little sleep. <laughs> Trump, the epitome of a sleep-deprived, emotionally unregulated, impulsive human. <laughs> but if there's one thing I'd like you to remember from today, it's not that Trump needs to sleep more, even though the world could literally be a better place if he did. It's that you could improve your emotional well-being and health by sleeping more. Doing that offers us the opportunity to dream to play out different emotions in a safe space. Because after all, we still need to feel fear in order to rehearse it and make sure that we are better equipped to cope with it in waking life. So I hope that you can join me in sleeping better, dreaming well, and hopefully the fearlessness will follow. But one more note, if you're worried that you don't dream, believe me, if you're sleeping enough, you are. If you want some evidence of that, you're welcome to come to the lab any time and we'll happily provide you with some evidence. So don't worry. Just enjoy sleep and don't feel guilty and lazy for doing so.